Very often in 3D CAD modeling there is more than just one way to obtain the desired shape. This tutorial is meant to show you two possible workflows to achieve a desired shape and we will take this opportunity to do a small discussion about the differences of the two workflows and the advantages and disadvantages of each workflow. Quite often in 3D CAD modeling there is more than just one way to obtain the desired shape in 3D. This tutorial is meant to show you two possible workflows uh, to obtain the desired model and we will talk about the advantages and disadvantages of both workflows. The version of FreeCAD used here is a 0.16 development snapshot on a Windows 7 64-bit system. FreeCAD is under continuous development and on a nearly daily basis changes are applied to the source code uh, correcting bugs and uh, introducing new features to the software. From time to time there is uh, some sort of feature freeze and a release version is being made. The latest stable release at the point of making this video is the 0 0.15.4671 release, which means that uh, the source code from the beginning received 4671 changes. Now if we take a look at the FreeCAD homepage and click on download, we will have our official stable installers and we will have our development versions. For Windows and Mac OS X users you can click on the link for the FreeCAD files page taking you to a GitHub repository where you can download the newest development snapshot uh, for Windows and for Mac OS X. With Windows you have the choice of downloading a 64-bit snap, uh, development snapshot or a 32-bit development snapshot. You don't need to download the source codes. So as I said the latest, develop, uh, the latest stable release sorry, is the 0 0.15.4671 uh, release. And if you take a look at the version numbers here, the latest development snapshot is at the moment of making this video the 0 0.16.6114, meaning we are already um, some sort of 1500 commits to the source code ahead of a stable release. A lot of bug fixes, a lot of feature improvements, and uh, there is really nothing negative in using a development snapshot. With a development snapshot you have a 7z archive under Windows and no exe installer. So you just download the archive and unpack it uh, to a directory of your liking. And if you do not have uh, the 0 0.15 stable release already installed on your computer, uh, there is no problem under Windows to install several versions of FreeCAD parallel. Um, you must make sure that depending on your version, for the 64-bit version, uh, you must have installed also the Visual C++ redistributable package for Visual Studio 2013. And for the 32-bit version you have to uh, install the 2008 uh, Service Pack 1 visual redistributable uh, package on your system. When using Ubuntu, Linux Mint or any other Debian based uh, Linux distribution you have uh, the option to uh, change to the daily PPA instead of using the FreeCAD version from uh, the systems repositories. As you can see here on the download page, 
with a chapter Ubuntu PPA packages, you should make sure that um, you do an update, an upgrade of your Linux version to the latest uh, version available. And then you have to add this PPA address, freecat minus maintainers slash freecat minus daily, to your system software sources, uh, either using the terminal or using the GUI. And then you should be able to update to the latest FreeCAD development version. So let's begin with our lesson. First, let's do uh, the ball bearing with using the part workbench. The modeling strategy will be first creating the outer ring, then creating the inner ring, then modeling the groove, and then adding the balls. So let's close these documents. Let's create a new empty document and make sure that the part workbench is selected. First of all, we will add a cylinder and we will apply to the cylinder with the data tab values for the radius to be 11 millimeters and the 8 should be 5 millimeters. Okay, we will switch to axometric view. We will uh, zoom outwards to fit all on the screen. And then we will insert a second cylinder. The second cylinder will get as values for radius and 8 a radius of 9 millimeters and the 8 will be left at 10 millimeters. We will apply a placement to the second cylinder in Z direction minus 2,5 millimeters. As I've said before in other tutorials, when doing a Boolean operation, like this time uh, we want to do a cut on these uh, two cylinders, it is better to have overlapping contours than uh, to have coincident uh, faces. It is not uh, in all cases necessary, but if you have uh, the uh, ability, please do so, it is better. So we will mark the cylinder we will uh, hold down the control key to also uh, highlight the second cylinder. We will apply a boolean cut and we just made the outer ring. The next operation is to insert another cylinder and to apply to the cylinder a radius of 6 millimeters and an 8 of 5 millimeters. We will add a fourth cylinder, giving the fourth cylinder uh, a radius of uh, 4 millimeters. The 8 we will also leave with 10 millimeters, that's okay. And we will also click on the placement tab and click on these three uh, small dots here to apply a uh, a placement in Z direction of minus 2,5 millimeters. We will also now highlight the cylinder 002. We will uh, press down the control key and also highlight the cylinder 003 and also apply a boolean cut here and we've just made the outer and the inner ring of the ball bearing. So the next step is to apply a fusion to these two objects. So we highlight these two objects and apply our fusion. To get our groove we will insert a torus. We will highlight the torus and we will change radius 1 to be 7,5 millimeters 
and we will change radius 2 to be 2,25 millimeters. We will apply a placement to the torus in Z direction of 2,5 millimeters. As you can see here, the torus just reached uh, the desired uh, position in 3D space. So then we will highlight the fusion, we will highlight the torus and we will apply a boolean cut and we just received our groove. The next thing is to insert a sphere, to highlight the sphere and to apply a radius, uh, to, uh, the radius applied is 2,2 millimeters. When we will um, apply a placement in Z direction to be 2,5 millimeters, and uh, I will choose the Y direction. I could also choose uh, the X direction, and I will apply a value in Y direction of 7,5 millimeters. As you can see here, the sphere just reached the desired. Uh, position in 3D space here in the center of uh, the groove. I will click on OK. As you have realized, the sphere uh, is a little bit uh, smaller than the groove. If the radius of the sphere would be the same as the radius of the groove, you would get difficulties in uh, doing a Boolean fusion on all objects because the geometric core used by FreeCAD doesn't handle very well um, such a coincident and uh, in this um, um, in this case co-radial faces. On the other hand if uh, you just want to achieve a technical abstract representation if you uh, say you uh, need uh, just an abstract model, not a wet realistic model. You um, could decide not to apply a groove here. Uh, you will just stay with your two rings and your uh, sphere here and your ray. In this case you would have overlapping faces and you would have no problem in doing a boolean fusion on uh, those objects in such a case. This is uh, something not to be easily decided and you will often reach uh, such uh, a point of decision in 3D modeling. So we will now highlight our sphere. We will change to the draft workbench, apply our ar array and we will change the array type from auto to polar. We will change the number of polar copies to be 10 and since uh, the standard axis for the polar array which is inserted is the z-axis we do not change the values here or any other values. We just click in empty space and FreeCAD updates our model. We will apply a Boolean fusion on these two objects, so we switch back to the part workbench, apply our fusion, and here we go, we've just finished our ball bearing. Now let's do our ball bearing model with using the part design workbench. The workflow will be similar, but we'll use different tools. And um, the idea is again to first do the outer ring. The sketch will already contain one half of the groove and then we will um, model the inner ring with the second half of the groove and then we will model one sphere and then we will do our array. So let's begin. Let's close these two documents. Let's create a new empty document, switch to the part design workbench, switch to the model view. Let's create a sketch on the YZ plane. Let's use the polyline tool. Let's start here doing a vertical line 
which reaches the horizontal axis. Then do a horizontal line, do vertical line, horizontal, vertical again. Do a right click to end the tool uh, poly line. Now we have an over constraint sketch. In this case, one of these three constraints should be deleted because uh, this is the over constraining. I will choose this one to be deleted. So um, I highlight this constraint here and press delete on keyboard or I could also do a right click here and select delete where that would have the same effect. So now we are no longer over constrained, we are under constrained. So let's do an arc element from this point here to this point here. Okay. Now the next thing is to um, apply equality to these two lines here and apply equality to these two lines here. So the next thing would be to select this point here and select this origin here and apply a horizontal dimensional constraint of 7,5 millimeters. Uh, the next thing would be to select these two points here and apply a horizontal dimensional constraint of 9 millimeters. When we select these two points and apply a horizontal dimensional constraint of 11 millimeters, we select the arc to have a radius of 2,25 millimeters and we select this line here and apply a vertical dimensional constraint of 5 millimeters. Now the sketch doesn't look right so let's go, go backwards one step and apply again 30 millimeters. Let's change the value to 20 millimeters the sketch does look good. Okay, let's try to change 15, 10, and the third step 5 millimeters. Okay. This is a common thing within FreeCAD. If you apply a change to a value which is uh, too big, the sketch could up uh, could end up in another possible mathematical solution, but an unwanted one. So, uh, as you have just seen, I played a little bit with the sketch and the constraints. I went back one step and applied the, uh, the dimensional constraint again. And then I uh, did change the dimensional constraint, not uh, in big steps, but in smaller steps, and ended up with the correct sketch here. So I close the sketch now, and I apply my revolution the vertical sketch axis we will use, that's OK. And here we go. So now we will apply our second revolution to get the inner, inner ring. So let's do a right click on the revolution here and either choose height selection or choose uh, the toggle visibility option. So I will choose height selection and then we'll, I will apply a new sketch on the YZ plane. I will uh, just draw a profile like I did before, doing a vertical line here, horizontal one here, vertical one here, horizontal line here and another vertical line here. Then I will create my arc 
from this point to this point, I will uh, apply equality to these two lines. I will apply to equality to these two lines. I will apply my radius here of 2,25 millimeters and uh, I will then apply here my horizontal dimensional constraint of 4 millimeters. I will apply here a value of 6 millimeters. I will apply here a horizontal dimensional constraint of 7,5 millimeters and I will apply here a vertical dimensional constraint of 5 millimeters and we are all set. I will close the sketch. I will do my revolution around the vertical sketch axis. I will choose OK. I will toggle the visibility of the outer ring here. And as you can see, we just obtained our two rings with our groove. So let's do the sphere. We highlight these two revolutions, apply a right click and toggle the visibility. We click an empty space to deselect everything. We apply a new sketch to a YZ plane. We click on OK, we zoom a little bit in. We will do our arc starting here, going from here to here. We will create a line from the endpoint of the arc to the other endpoint and applying a vertical dimensional constraint. We will then uh, apply a another line from this endpoint here just going down to the horizontal axis and we will toggle the line to be of construction type. We will then choose the midpoint of the arc and this line here and apply a symmetry. We will apply a radius to the arc of 2,25 millimeters we will apply a distance here of horizontal um, dimensional constraint of 7,5 millimeters and we will apply our vertical dimensional constraint here of 2,5 millimeters and in this case um, the auto constraining did not work. Um, we will constrain this point here to be onto the horizontal axis. Now we are all set. We close the sketch. We do our revolution, but we will not choose our vertical sketch axis. We will choose sketch axis 0. OK. And now we have our sphere here. We will also apply our uh, array and we can't apply a polar pattern feature because the polar pattern feature is only meant to be applied to pads or pockets within the part design workbench. We have one single solid and we uh, want to apply uh, uh, some sort of uh, an array to it so we have to use the array tool from the draft workbench. So we highlight the revolution here we switch to the draft workbench and we do our array. We switch 
again to polar type, we change the number of copies to 10. And here we go. We toggle the visibility of these two revolutions. And we could now do a fusion on all these three objects. Um, and so we have also created the ball bearing using several sketches. So as you can see, both workflows have had advantages and disadvantages. If you will change later one of the dimensional values, for example, it is, in my opinion, a little bit easier to just uh, search for the right sketch and then to uh, enter the sketch in edit mode and apply a new dimensional value to one of the constraints than to search um, in the part uh, workbench for uh, the appropriate primitive and change its placement or whatever. But of course, um, it is easier to apply um, the draft move and rotate commands to a part created within the part workbench. With a part design workbench, you have to apply the move and rotate commands to the sketches you used, uh, namely to the first sketch you have used. And uh, of course, with part design, maybe you will take a little bit longer, uh, speaking of the time needed to do the model. But uh, on the other side, if you use the part workbench, you noticed that we had sometimes to uh, switch to the draft workbench or uh, to the sketcher workbench maybe, and to use some tools from there. So this is also a little bit more work. As I said before, there is no single uh, uh, and no no only real one way to do a model in 3D space. There are often more than one ways to do a model and uh, depending on the purpose of your model and uh, the shape of your model, maybe you will be forced to use a specific workbench for your purpose. As you have seen, we did switch workbenches quite often. And every time we used a pull-down menu. On my personal system, I use a little trick to speed up switching between workbenches. Now since FreeCAD is programmed mostly in Python, if I uh, also enable per view the Python console um, and uh, let's say if I will switch to the part design workbench, you can see in the last line of the Python console the Python command used to activate the workbench part design workbench. So I did record a macro using the record button, uh, switching just to one of the workbenches and then I stop the recording and for example the macro used to switch to the sketcher workbench does look like this. I, I use this button here, execute macro, I select my macro which is uh, named here wb underscore sketcher uh, dot fc macro and if I go to edit, you will see that it just contains one line activating the workbench sketcher workbench. The next step was to use the tools customize menu to go to the category macros and to apply to each just recorded macro, in my case I recorded four macros to switch to the sketcher workbench, to the part workbench, to the part design workbench and to the draft workbench. Uh, I applied here a menu text, a tooltip, uh, a 
sort of short help and a keyboard shortcut. And I also applied an icon to this macro. The next step would be to define a global toolbar. So I went to the toolbars and selected here from the, tool, uh, from the drop down menu the global section and then I created with new a custom toolbar. And uh, the custom toolbar contains now uh, all of these four macros and um, if I tick this box here to make the custom toolbar show up and I click on close I have to restart FreeCAD to apply the changes. So after restart of FreeCAD my custom toolbar shows up and within the preferences I have set the initial workbench to be activated to be at startup the complete workbench to make sure that everything I have set up as user um, customization will be added to FreeCAD. And so this is my custom toolbar showing up in every workbench and I quickly can now switch to the Sketcher workbench by clicking on the icon here just switch to the Sketcher workbench or using uh, the designated keyboard shortcuts. So well speaking about different ways of doing a CAD model and uh, speaking about efficiency and parametric and history and things like that well what about adding a bonus lesson? So let's jump aboard our time machine and head right back to the first lesson we did the Turner's Cube. At the time when you did the Turner's Cube as a first lesson, uh, the main point of the lesson was to get you familiar with the pad and the pocket function. And so, some users ask uh, one of the first obvious questions, is there a way to duplicate or reuse the sketches to get a more efficient model? Of course, this is uh, possible. We learned during the lessons that you could reuse the sketches by copying them for example to the clipboard and inserting them uh, somewhere else and you can also reorient the sketches and attach them to other faces. This is possible. But as you can see we used a lot of pockets and uh, those pockets all have the same dimensions. The big pockets have the same dimensions and the middle pockets as well. And speaking of an efficient parametric 3D model, this way of modeling is not an efficient modeling. But this is quite common after some time if you learn new tricks and maybe the software did get one or two new features. Uh, if you look then at your CAD models, you will not be the first one to say, oh dear, what did I do there? Let's throw the model into the digital trash and redo everything again. So if we will set up a task saying, let's do a Turner's Cube using the part design workbench and use a parametric modeling using S few features and as few dimensions as possible, this would look like this. So let's close this document, create a new one, switch to the part design workbench and the first thing we did was creating a new sketch on the XY plane. We created a rectangle we applied symmetry to these two points in regard to the y-axis and we applied symmetry to these two points in regard to the x-axis. Then we applied equality 
to these two lines and we applied a dimension of 200 millimeters to this line here. There is nothing to optimize here. So we close the sketch, we do our pad, we do it symmetric, we change the dimension value to 200 millimeters. OK, the first operation with pad, there is nothing we could do to optimize that. There is only one thing uh, which is missing at the moment. We would like to be able to set um, in this case an equality constraint or something similar between the dimension used in the sketch and the aid of the pad uh, we defined with 200 millimeters and being symmetric. At the moment this is not possible but I have read in the forums that with the 0 0.16 development snapshot something called expressions is introduced and uh, uh, if I understood all the postings were correct now this is also possible to um, set up relations between constraints in different sketches and constraints used on operations like this. So the next thing would be um, our pocketing. We would not use several single pockets to make an efficient parametric model. We will use a revolved profile and an array and then doing a boolean cut and using clones to get uh, the rest to pockets. So now let's toggle the visibility of the pad, apply a new sketch, in our case now to the YZ plane. Let's use the polyline tool, start on the vertical axis here, go upwards, and then apply our three pockets. Like this. We now have an over constraint sketch, so we will delete this constraint here. We will apply equality to these three lines. Because this dimension we will set up with 25 millimeters, and this dimension we will also set up with 25 millimeters. So now we will set up the radius of the three pockets, the biggest one being 93,75 millimeters. The next one is 3 points. Now let's select this point and this point, applying a horizontal dimensional constraint of 62,5 millimeters. And let's select these two points, applying a horizontal dimensional constraint of 31,25 millimeters. That's it. We close our sketch, we do our revolution. And here we go. The next thing would be to switch to the draft workbench, have the revolution highlighted, and then doing an array, make sure the array is highlighted, change the array type from auto to polar, change the number of polar copies to 4, and change the axis to be not the z-axis. In this case, the axis of uh, of a array of a polar revolution, if you will call it like that, will be the x-axis. So let's change the value for the x-axis to one, and change the 
value for the z-axis to 0 back. Now we will have something like this. We will set the fuse parameter to true to obtain not four overlapping solids but one single solid. Okay, so the next thing is that we will highlight this revolution here and do a draft clone of the highlight uh, revolution. We will use the clone of the revolution and do a placement. We will change the placement to be incremental. We will choose the Y axis as rotational axis and we will apply a rotation of 90 degrees. We will then clone the revolution again this time applying to the clone an incremental placement we will change as, rotation, uh, as rotational axis the y-axis but in this case we will apply minus 90 degrees. We click on apply, choose OK and this is one of the limits of FreeCAD at the moment. It uh, is of importance um, at which point in the history of a part you did do the clone. If I will change the sketch or the revolution at some um, point, the clone will also change. But if I will add something to a revolution, the clone will not change because the clone was made in a uh, point of history of a part when only the revolution existed with the sketch. So let's select the array, the two clones, let's switch to the part workbench and do a fusion of all these solids. Let's toggle the visibility of the pad. Let's select the pad and the fusion, apply a boolean cut and we have made our Turner's cube. As you have realized, we only used 200 millimeters here as dimension, 200 millimeters with the pad, and our few dimensional constraints with this one revolution. So this would be a very efficient way to use the part design workbench and design a, a Turner's cube. The Turner's cube is parametric, you can change your values and it is history based, you can go back in the history of creating the part. Well, with that being said, we have reached the end of today's lesson. I hope I did show something useful and you had fun learning new tricks with FreeCAD. As usual, feel free to leave any comments, critics, remarks, requests or something like that related directly to the video here on YouTube. Or if you have more complex questions, feel free to reg re uh, register for free uh, with a forum on freecardweb.org and upload snapshots and uh, post your questions there. I hope you uh, will enjoy working with FreeCAD and, well, maybe see you on another video. Bye!